<laughs> All right. We're now streaming on YouTube. Except it's backwards. That's weird. Hey, everybody. You're How are on you doing? Yeah, I'm glad to see you. so many people joining today. So about this time of the year, I start to think about... Um, I usually do a program that highlights some of the interesting scientific discoveries or interesting things that have happened in science in the past year. So I'm gonna put up a slideshow. We're gonna go through each one of these things. I mean, there's literally thousands more than what we're gonna talk about here. But, um, and if, if you guys have any that you wanna talk about, certainly just jump in. And again, I would like this to be more of a discussion than a lecture. So if you have any questions, just yell it out and I can see if I can help you out, okay? So I gotta, let me see if I can share my screen. There we go, so from beginning. All right, can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. So obviously one of the biggest problems we have on our planet is pollution. And one of the biggest parts of pollution is the amount of plastic that we dump in the, on the, or the earth, especially in the oceans. Mm -hmm. Well, so to address a different ecological crisis, scientists engineered a plastic eating super enzyme that can break down bottles in days. Now, this is really significant because if you just threw a plastic bottle out and buried it in a landfill, it could take hundreds and hundreds of years before it decomposes. And usually when it decomposes, it only breaks down into smaller, smaller particles. It doesn't mm -hmm. actually go away. So what's mm -hmm. cool about having these super enzymes that they created is that we can mm -hmm. hopefully start to take care of some of the plastic pollution that we have. You know, that was, that's what recycling is for. Yeah, but the, here's the problem. Recycling is a good thing, but mm -hmm. you know that kind of circular thing that shows um, reuse, recycle, and what was the other one? I forget. A reduce, reuse, and recycle. Well, the mm -hmm. best out of all of those is reduce because mm -hmm. even recycling takes a mm -hmm. lot of energy and those mm -hmm. bottles have to be produced. So once they're produced, something has to happen with them, whether we throw them in mm -hmm. the landfill. You know, there are places in the ocean where there are, mm -hmm. you know, just floating plastic islands, just mm -hmm. as big as a state, which oh, is all the plastic that we throw away. Oh my. But that's another that's story. What a I fish. actually have this program that I do on plastic and pollution. It's really pretty scary. Mm -hmm. well, what are some of the things we make with you, reusable plastics? Oh man, there's hundreds of thousands of things. You just, you look around your, your room, where you're sitting right now. I mean, first of all, your computer's made of plastic. You, reusable, I'm talking about reusable plastic. Well, just about all plastic is reusable. Okay. okay. Um, if, if you look at the bottom of, uh, say, a bottle, it'll have a number. It tells you the type of plastic it is. Okay. All of those need to be sorted. Like, you can't put them all, like PET or some mm -hmm. other plastics. You don't want to mix them together. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's, there's some really great things that are being done with recycled plastic. But again, it's better to not make the plastic or to, again, with these enzymes, completely get rid of it. Okay. Because actually, the next slide actually talks a little bit more about this. This year, scientists published several studies showing that the amount, oh, yeah, here, microplastics invade furthest reaches of the globe. So they've actually found microplastic. Um, if you look at this picture, you can see how bad the plastic pollution is in a lot of places. What happens is, after years and years of these things floating around and out in the ocean and getting pounded by waves, they break down slowly into tiny little particles of plastic. And unfortunately, some of that gets, gets airbound. So this year, scientists published several studies showing that the amount of, is much greater than previously thought and the reach is much further than previously documented. In April, researchers documented microplastics in Antarctica sea ice for the first time. In June, a study published by scientists estimated 
a hundred a thousand tons of airborne plastic debris rains down on national parks and remote stretches of wilderness in the United States every year. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, ha what happens to the plastic that you can't recycle? Um, unfortunately, it gets either buried or it winds up floating around in the ocean. And you know, not only does it look really bad, but there are animals, for instance, turtles that eat jellyfish. That's one of, the, one of the things that they eat in their diet. Well, if there's a plastic bag floating out in the ocean, it looks like a jellyfish. So they eat that plastic bag and it kills them. Mm. Oh, Alan, I think Bonnie was asking what happens to the plastic that we recycle, not that we okay. recycle. Um, it's, it's often made into other things. I, was, I, I, I asked uh, what happened, because I know you get some uh, detergents and other things that, you know, that they tell you, well, you don't put that with your bottles. You, that, that I, don't, I wonder what happens to those. Oh. So the ones that don't get recycled, right? Yeah. Well, like I said, unfortunately, they either end up in the, in the landfill you know, they go in with all the other garbage and then they don't decompose mm -hmm. or they wind up floating around in the ocean. Mm -hmm. Oh. Mm -hmm. You know, causing not only horrible things, but when these, mm -hmm. when these plastics start to degrade and start to break mm -hmm. down because of the sun, like I said, they don't go away. They just get and turn into smaller particles. Well, mm -hmm. guess what? Little tiny fish eat those thinking that they're food. Yeah. Floating and around get, and choke to death and die. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they die. I mean, it's just, what? when you, you study this, it's just unbelievable the amount, you know, I mean, oh, I thought somebody was starting a party over there. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, yeah, it's yeah, amazing. Yeah. Like, for instance, they, they test the breast milk of, of mothers mm -hmm. and they find plastic, molecular yeah. plastic yeah. in the breast milk. So right from mm -hmm. the beginning of a person's life, they're getting this plastic pollution mm -hmm. into their system. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. every day, you know, those micro particles that are floating and going to Antarctica, you're breathing those mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. Come on. So that's pollution. Yeah, it's all kinds of pollution. I mean, ground pollution, air pollution, everything. Right. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So here's another headline that you probably won't see on CNBC, but in England, archaeologists reveal that they determine the origins of some of the boulders that make up Stonehenge. Now, mm -hmm. this is pretty cool because when you think about when Stonehenge was built, it says here, Stonehenge, which is estimated to be 5,000 years old, consists of two distinct types of stone slabs set in half circles. Researchers traced one type of, of smaller blue stones to a site in Wales, 150 miles away. Research from July suggests that the 30 foot nine meter sandstone bowl is called Sarsens that can constitute the rest of the monument. It came from a nearby woodland area. Still, Stonehenge builders had to drag 50,000 pound Sarsens from 15 miles away. Wow. So the fact that they even built that with no machinery, think about that. A 50,000 yeah. pound slab of stone. They had absolutely no technology, except for primitive technologies, to get those stones and drag them 15 miles to build Stonehenge in that spot. Yeah. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, yeah. I think, I think one thing is interesting is they had to do that kind of thing with um, the pyramids and uh, all the monuments in uh, Egypt. Right. Actually, I read an interesting article one time saying that if we, if we had to build the pyramids today, we could never do it. No. Mm -hmm. You know, it, I mean, it took them certainly tens of years to build those pyramids and thousands and thousands of people. And another mm -hmm. thing that's interesting, speaking of pyramids, Dow. A lot of originally people thought that the scientists thought that the people who built the pyramids were slaves. Well, it turns mm -hmm. out that they determined that 
during the off season when people couldn't plant crops, like in the winter time when things wouldn't grow, they took all the people who were out of work, basically farmers and stuff, and they actually paid them and fed them and used them as labor to build the pyramid. So they weren't slaves, from what I read. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, if I could ask, if somebody has the TV or the radio in the background, if you could please mute that, I'd greatly appreciate it. And um, Alan, are you planning on doing any experiments today or predominantly just a presentation? I have a, a question about that. Okay, thank you. I can stand on my head if you want. I don't know if that'll help. <laughs> so I, I can't see the top of my screen here. Oops, sorry, let me go back. So NASA actually was able to send a, a, a spaceship, let's just call it a spaceship, a probe, to actually sample rocks from an asteroid. Mm -hmm. And this happened last year in October. The NASA spacecraft OSIRIS-REx reached mm -hmm. out and grabbed rocks from a 4.5 billion year old asteroid named Bennu. Mm -hmm. The mission, which took place more than 200 million miles away from Earth, marked the first time the space agency reached out and touched an asteroid. Mm -hmm. the, the sample should arrive on Earth three years from now. Experts think mm -hmm. that it may contain water and, pre and prebi prebiotic material. So prebiotic material is, biotic means living, free mm -hmm. means before living, or mm -hmm. what, for instance, proteins are made up of amino acids. They may find amino acids on that asteroid. Mm -hmm. So those, that's what they mean by prebiotic material. The building blocks of life, such evidence might offer clues to how life started on Earth. So this can get into like a crazy discussion because nobody really knows how life got started on Earth. But one of the, one of the thoughts is that um, the Earth was actually seeded by asteroids and comets, and a lot of the amino acids and things that were found on these rogue objects that hit the Earth actually sparked some of the life that got started on Earth. So another thing that happened this year, or well, last year, that never happened before, says, reaching beyond Earth, SpaceX launched the world's first crewed commercial space flight, rocketing to NASA's astronauts to orbit aboard the, the Crew Dragon spaceship. The mission was a test to prove that SpaceX human space flight abilities, ability the Dragon capsule carried, well, these guys' names, Earth to orbit. So this is the first time that our country has used a private organization Mm. to take people into space. So mm. that's a pretty interesting accomplishment. And you could mm. kind of in your head project ahead what that might mean. If it's a private company, they're for profit. So mm. they're not mm. getting really their, their money from the government like NASA does. So mm. they may start to offer, and as a matter of fact, they're, they're actually already doing it, but you have to be a bazillionaire to be able to do it. They're mm. offering rides to outer space. And it costs oh, millions yeah. of dollars right now if you want to go to outer space on SpaceX. Mm -hmm. And they're not mm -hmm. able to do that yet, but it's in the plans. Mm -hmm. Okay, not all the headlines are great headlines. Unfortunately, in 50 years, I can't even read my own. For some reason, I can't see the top of my screen. It's getting blocked by all the, can I get rid of that? Let me see. No, I can't get rid of that. There's a space, there's a bar going across the top of my screen that's blocking my thing. Well, anyway, in the last 50 years, I think it's, uh, can you guys can see how many percentage? Yeah, I see it. What does it say? I can't read it. Oh, you mean to, in 50 years? Yes. Uh, humans have uh, decimated two thirds of the world's wildlife. 
Okay, thank you. At two thirds, I couldn't read the two thirds part. I forgot what it said. So since 1970, 4,392 mammals, amphibians, birds, fish, and reptile species populations sizes decreased, declined by 68%. According to the World Wildlife Fund reported released this year, animals living in Latin America and the Caribbean took the biggest hit. Their population mm. sizes decreased by 94%. Oh, now, population right. decrease is not necessarily extinction, but mm. it's definitely on its way to extinction. And mm -hmm. habitat destruction is cited as the leading mm -hmm. cause of these yeah. massive losses. The United Nations mm -hmm. Global Biodiversity Outlook report produced similar grim, grim results. So mm -hmm. what is habitat loss? So some rich person goes in and looks at this barren, what he thinks is a barren landscape, whether it be a mm -hmm. forest or a field or whatever, and says, mm -hmm. you know what? We should just build a condominium complex there. Mm -hmm. So they destroy all the natural vegetation and animals that live mm -hmm. in that area. They build a condominium mm -hmm. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. animals are not designed to live in an area like that. So no, the populations mm -hmm. start to decline. And if we continue to do that, they can actually go extinct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, e extinction is actually part of the natural, the natural way of things on the planet. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. humans are increasing the rate of extinction ex exponentially, it's in crazy. Mm -hmm. Like the only yeah. time that species die off faster is when it's an mm -hmm. instant extinction. Like when the asteroid hit the earth and killed all the dinosaurs and 94% mm -hmm. of the other animals and plants on the planet. Mm -hmm. Like that happened almost instantly within you know a couple of years. Mm -hmm. But since mm -hmm. humans have started polluting and taking over and basically being selfish about using the earth for themselves and not worrying too much about everything else. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, humans are actually creating an accelerated, um, you know, disproportionate amount of extinction mm -hmm. going on in the planet. Mm -hmm. Right. Can you hold on a second, guys? I'm gonna switch on my other computer because I can't read the top of these. So this one, this next one, just so you know, says artificial intelligence spots breast prostate cancer near perfectly. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. So in January, researchers published findings showing Google DeepMind AI, which is an artificial intelligence system, outperformed six human radiologists in spotting abnormalities on x-ray images of nearly 29,000 women. For the study, the AI system demonstrated a 57 percent reduction rate in false positives. So one of the problems doctors have in, is, is actually detecting cancer at its mm. lowest rate. Mm. So supposedly most cancers, the earlier you catch them, mm. the better chance you have to survive. So now yeah. that they have, mm. a, they have you know, artificial intelligence, which is computer systems and diagnostics that can actually find these cancers sooner than any human can, which will hopefully increase the or decrease the mortality rate. In an unrelated you study- You know, dolphins live out cancer. What was that? I said dolphins live out cancer. I couldn't understand the first word, sorry. I said dogs can sniff out cancer. Oh yes, dogs can sniff out cancer, dogs. that's three. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you know, we used to have a guy who came here to the senior center and he had, um, had, had a dog that had to stay with him. And mm -hmm. that dog actually sniffed out his adrenal hormones, believe it or not. When his adrenal mm -hmm. hormones started getting low, he had to actually take a shot and mm -hmm. they can sniff out cancer and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. You know, there's so many stories out there about how dogs can help people. Um, mm -hmm. They can actually tell by smelling certain chemical reactions in a person's body, whether they're about to mm -hmm. have a seizure. Right, so I, read, right, right, right. I actually read right. this story about a girl who, you know, she's in a wheelchair, unfortunately, but she mm -hmm. she's prone to having seizures. And mm -hmm. right. she has a dog 
that actually warns her when the seizure is about to happen. So she can get strapped in and actually get ready for the seizure, knowing that it's coming. Yeah, that's well, does, it, does it have to be a specific kind of dog? Um, they do use certain kinds of dogs, and I'm not sure which ones. But I would think that you can pretty much train any kind of a dog because their sense of smell is so much more acute than humans. It's mm -hmm. thousands of times more sensitive. Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, diabetics, people who are severely diabetic, you can actually get a dog that can tell you when your blood sugar goes well, just by smelling mm -hmm. it. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Wow. So let's see, an unrelated study in July researchers at the University of Pittsburgh trained an AI program to recognize prostate cancer from tissue mm -hmm. slides. During mm -hmm. testing, the AI demonstrated 98% sensitivity and 97% specificity in detecting prostate cancer, which is pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. yeah. So like I said, early detection is what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. right. So this is interesting. One of the things that has happened last year and happens every, just about every year, living things mm -hmm. that we've never seen before are discovered on our planet. So using the Schmidt Ocean Institute underwater ROV, by the way, ROV stands for Remote Operated Vehicle. In the waters of, of Western Australia, researchers discovered both the longest animal ever recorded, a 46 meter, 150 foot siphonophore, <laughs> whatever that is, it's like a worm and a coral reef tall, taller than the Empire State Building. So I find this really interesting because we actually know more about Mars than we do about the oceans of our planet, which is kind of crazy when you think about it, since you could just jump in the water anytime you want and look around, right? You would think that scientists would spend more time, but only a very, very, very small percentage of our oceans have actually been looked at scientifically. And access is the biggest problem. You have to have specialized equipment for one. And it's not that easy. You know, when you go deep into the ocean, you run to thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds of pressure. And, you know, you have to have a, a submarine or a bathysphere that could actually, you know, handle that kind of pressure. So to, to, to discover a coral reef that's taller than the Empire State Building, like you have to think to yourself, like obviously it's been there for thousands of years. How come nobody discovered it before? Well, it's in deep water and it's not easy, easily accessible. Next, okay. So lab grown meat is something that happened in 2020. You may, have known, you may remember this from the news. This is something that made it to the news. It's now possible to grow meat by taking a few cells from an animal and then simulate growth with appropriate nutrients. Just last month, Singapore's Food Regulatory Agency approved the sale of this cultured meat developed by US startup Eat Just. Acceptable meat substitutes create a benign change in how we feed ourselves. So what they do is they take a couple of cells of say, the muscle of a cow and they grow it into a big muscle of a cow and you could actually eat that as food. So think about the repercussions of that, the, actually the positive repercussions because one of the biggest polluting factors on our planet is agriculture. And in ways you probably wouldn't even think of. Cows emit more methane gas than any other greenhouse gas that we could pollute in the world, we could produce in the world. You know, um, a greenhouse gas is, is what pulls the heat on earth, which is causing global warming. So imagine if we could take raising cows out of the picture and actually just growing cows in the laboratory, we could actually save on pollution. The amount of garbage that's produced in say uh, a feedlot 
where there's hundreds of thousands of cows is just beyond comprehension. It pollutes the water, it pollutes the air, it pollutes the landscape. It's just unbelievable. You know, just so people can go get a quarter pounder or eat meat. So coming up with other ways of feeding the human race, like the large population, you know, there is over 9 billion people on the planet. We have to figure out how to feed them. And this is just one discovery that happened last year. So paleontologists discovered that, that early dinosaurs laid leathery, soft-shelled eggs, like snakes and turtles do. Previously discovered dinosaur eggs were all hard-shelled, but fossilized eggs from two dino species in the Gobi Desert were found to have soft shells. Now, why is this significant, you think? Like, why would people be spending time and money? Well, it all goes to trying to figure out our origins and the origins of other things on our planet and find out what's related to other things. So the fact that dinosaurs laid soft shell eggs like amphibians do now and snakes do now, there may be a genetic link between those two. Maybe one developed from another, who knows, you know? So that's the reason that scientists look into things. So that was an interesting discovery from last year. And I find this interesting because I really love collecting fossils and paleontology. So maybe you won't find this interesting, but I find it pretty fascinating. This is kind of, so kind of along the same lines, but this is really con not really considered a fossil. An adult cave bear carcass was found perfectly preserved on a remote Siberian island with its nose, teeth, and internal organs still intact. This is the first and only find of its kind, a whole bear carcass with soft tissue. Researcher at Northern, this lady, don't even ask me to say her name, <laughs> at Northeastern Federal University in Russia said in September press release. So we have an animal that doesn't exist on our planet anymore and we find it buried in the ice completely intact. Um, think Jurassic Park, guys. If you ever saw the movie Jurassic Park, having the DNA from this animal may lead to cloning down the line. And possibly the theory is to bring back animals that have gone extinct. Not that, you know, of course, there's a whole scientific and moral issue with, involved in that you know debate but um that's kind of what we're thinking about here and to find instead of just salt you know a fossil of bones which we can't use we could actually see the complete animal you know when you find a fossil of a dinosaur you find a bunch of bones you put them together you really have no idea what the animal looked like in real life so up until now we've only had bones and teeth of this animal and scientists sort of put it together the way they thought it should go. But you still really don't know what the skin looks like. You don't know what the fur looks like. You don't know how furry it was. You don't know really anything about it. It's mostly speculation based on other things that you know. But to find a complete animal is just, it's amazing. So now they know exactly what this animal looked like and what it ate. You know. If the animal's stomach is intact, they could actually find out what it ate. You know, we're talking about something that happened 15,000 years ago. So I found this really interesting. You know, this is <laughs> the diabolical ironclad beetle's exoskeleton is indestructible. <laughs> the diabolical ironclad beetle absolutely lives up to its name. While most bugs live only a few weeks, these beetles have a lifespan of about eight years, which is roughly the equivalent of a human living several thousand years. To achieve such a feat, they evolve some remarkable armor. The roughly inch long insect can survive being run over by a car. And if you can't believe that, University of California, Irving engineer David I don't say that, Casales, and his team piled into a 
Toyota Camry and ran over one twice and it lived. After several more technical experiments, the team found that the Beetle can withstand immense pressure up to 29, up to 39,000 times its own body weight. Now, besides this being an interesting find in the world of bugs entomology, what can a scientist, think about what a scientist can do with that kind of knowledge. Remember before we talked about <clears throat> studying the oceans, the amount of, excuse me, I'm doing a program. Yeah. Yes. Um, sorry guys. So remember I said that going deep down into the ocean, for instance, is really hard to do because of the, the enormous pressures. Well, scientists could look at this beetle and look at the shape and look at the material that its, its exoskeleton is made of and try to synthesize that and make that product that they can use in for instance, going down into the ocean where there's really, really high pressures. Or maybe they can use it to build an armored tank or some other kind of thing to protect people. You know, maybe they could use it for bulletproof vests. You never know. So, you know, scientists don't look at these things just as a real interesting curiosity. Once they do find this curiosity, they try to figure out what they can do with it to better the human race or protect the human race. So I should have, probably should have put this one where I, where I talked about the other cancer thing. But scientists have figured out that, well, let me just read it here. In June, the veterinary research at the University of Missouri leveraged, leveraged per personalized medicine to successfully treat bone cancer in 14 dogs. So what they did was by, they made a vaccine from the dog's own tumor so the scientists were able to target a specific cancer cell and avoid the toxic effects of chemotherapy. Compared with the average survival time with amputation and chemotherapy, the dogs that underwent the immunotherapy treatment lived several months longer. Five lived more than two years after they started treatment. The study's successful result, result helped the research team secure FDA approval to test this method on human brain cancer patients. Now, you may not think that a couple of months longer in a dog's life is not that big a deal, but you know, when you talk about how a dog, you know, a dog that's 10 years old is really a hundred years old in human life. So imagine if you can use this and once they perfect it, that they could actually use this vaccine to specifically target a certain cancer in a person and actually give them a much longer lifespan than they normally would. So that's, that's a pretty interesting um, find from last year. So can somebody read me the, the top part of that? Astronomers detect possible sign of life in Venus's atmosphere. Thank you. So, <laughs> so, they're not saying that there are little critters running around on Mars, but when scientists, when you can't go to a place to try to figure out if something lives there, you have to look for byproducts of life. For instance, I talked about cows producing methane, right? So imagine you looked at, you looked at Venus and you found lots and lots of methane. You have to figure out where it comes from. And one of the sources of methane could be life, right? So scientists believe that they might have discovered signs of life on Venus after discovering a gas called phosphine. Phos mm -hmm. Phos <laughs> okay, I should have I should have practiced this before I started this. Phosphine. It's like it looks like phosphine. Yeah, phosphine. Okay, phosphine. I'll take that. In the planet's outer clouds, on Earth, phosphine is a toxic gas produced by bacteria that doesn't need oxygen in places like swamps. So they're anaerobic bacteria. Venus 
The second planet from the sun is the hottest planet in our solar system with a dense atmosphere that can lead to temperature that high as, that soar as high as 800 degrees. And its atmosphere is full of sulfuric acid. Scientists previously didn't believe that any form of life could survive around on or around Venus. But the presence of phosphine, phosphine <laughs> sorry about that, suggests that only something alive could be the source of this gas. Now, they don't know that for 100% sure. There are other things, and I read the complete article, there are other things that could produce this gas, but it doesn't look like Venus has what it takes to do that geologically, but nobody's really sure. So it's really just one drop in the bucket of trying to discover what might be causing that gas. So that's a pretty interesting find. Imagine if there was some bacteria floating around in the atmosphere. You know, one of the reasons scientists look for life on our own planet in places they didn't think it could ever exist. Like for instance, they go to Yellowstone or they go to, yeah, like Yellowstone or other places that have like hot geysers and things like that. You would think a geyser shooting water out at, you know, a couple of hundred degrees that nothing could live there, but they do. So if things could live in the harshest environments on earth, there's a possibility that they could live on the harshest environments and other planets, okay? Anybody out there believe that there's life anywhere else besides Earth? <laughs> I do. Do you? Life. life. What makes you think that? Just curious. Well, to me, life, all you got to have is, is moist and, and heat. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, exactly those, that's why it's so interesting. You know, when they dove down to the deepest parts of the ocean, they never could have imagined that they would find an abundance of life in the deepest parts of the ocean. Because up until that point, scientists thought that all life depended on the sun. Now, even if like humans, for instance, we don't directly photosynthesize or make energy from the sun, but the food that we eat relies on the sun. So we are reliant on the sun for our survival. But it wasn't until they went way deep down into the ocean and found things living around these hydrothermic vents, they realized that animals can adapt to creating energy from chemicals. So instead of calling it photosynthesis, it's called chemosynthesis. So they take the chemicals that are coming from deep down inside the earth out of these vents and they're turning them into energy so they can survive. So when they find these animals that are living in, in a place they never thought animals could live, those are called extremophiles. They can live in extreme places on earth and they start to think well you know venus is kind of like a hydrothermal vent you know maybe it's possible it's so hot it's producing sulfuric acid and all kinds of things is it possible that there could be life living in the atmosphere or bacteria living in the atmosphere of venus so you know it's, it's just it's a stepping stone to figure out things what's going on in our soul All right, can somebody read me the, uh, the top part of this? A, a global hum is traced to the birth of a volcano. Okay, thanks. So this is interesting. Scientists are keeping track of everything on our planet, from what's going on in the ground to what's going on in the atmosphere, what's going on in space, and so on. And scientists, it says here, beginning in November 2018, scientists were puzzled by a seismic hum that could be detected around the world. Investigations into this source came up short until January 2020, when German researchers declared the humming was due to a new underwater volcano forming near Madagascar. As of, as of January, 
the volcano formed by this draining mag wait, wait, formed by this draining magma measured three miles in diameter and raises half a mile from the sea floor. And one of the scientists was quoted as saying, this thing was built from zero, from zero in six months. So if it continues to build at that rate, we may have another island on our planet, you know, within the next 150 to 200 years. That's pretty cool. Yeah, you know, I don't know if you guys know this, but places, one of the most famous places is Hawaii. You know, Hawaii is just, all the different islands of Hawaii are just the tops of volcanoes sticking out of the water. So islands are formed and places where life can get started happen when a volcano just breaks the surface of the ocean, becomes an island, and um, I mean, we could see how much life there is on the uh, Hawaiian islands now, right? So it'd be another island where people, you know, people and animals can, can exist, okay? So this is interesting because scientists are always trying to figure out ways to help people who can't see or cannot see well, see better or see for the first time. And these guys, Eduardo Fernandez, the director of the Neural Engineering at the University of Miguel Hernandez in Spain, developed an implant that feeds directly to the brain and allows previously blinded individuals to experience a low resolution form of sight. According to the MIT Technology Review, this goal is to restore sight to the 36 million blind people worldwide who wish they could see again. Using advanced technology combined with better understanding of how humans see. So what they did, they, they actually implanted thousands of receptors on this person's eye that receive photons of light and turn that into electrical energy and it's connected to the person's brain and it simulates a real eyeball. Unfortunately, at this point, the person can't see really clearly um, I was reading the rest of this article and it's interesting, like they could, if you drew a, a square on a piece of paper, they can tell it's a square, but they can't see definition really well. So things look really blurry to them. But as that technology gets better and better, who knows? Imagine being blind from birth and then suddenly being able to see, I can't, I can't imagine how incredible that would be, how incredible that, would be, you know? You know, as, as a sort of a tangent, this is interesting because many, many years ago, I read an article about a guy who was blind from birth and he was struck by lightning and can see after that. So you never know, man, what's gonna happen. Gosh, that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I could think of, I mean, that it was really only speculation that could have been just something blocking, you know, the path of the uh, electricity going from the eye to the brain. And when it got hit by lightning, it was just jarred out of the way, it was fried and yeah, so that's pretty cool. So who would like to read the uh, top of this one? Astronomers capture an image of another galaxy as it existed 11 billion years ago. So I'm gonna read this and I'll talk about how cool this really is. Using images from NASA's Hubble Space Telescope, lead re researcher, Titanian One, that's, I'm just, that's how I'm gonna say it, of Australia's ARC Center of Excellence and her colleagues discovered a cosmic ring of fire galaxy recorded 11 billion years ago. According to the study published in Nature Astronomy, the newly developed image could bring fresh observations to previous theories about how early galactic structures formed and evolved. So let's talk a little bit about what this is. First of all, when you look up into space, you're looking at basically, you're looking in the, into the past because the light from a galaxy or a star that reaches your eye actually left that star or galaxy, you know, hundreds or billions of years ago. So 
for instance, this galaxy right here is 11 billion light years away from us, which means the light that enters your eye when you look at this galaxy left that galaxy 11 billion years ago and is now reaching your eyeball, mm -hmm. which means you're looking at the galaxy the way it looked 11 billion years ago. You guys kind of following this? <laughs> <laughs> It's just mind boggling. It, yeah. It's, it's my, you know, I used to do this program. I used to teach astronomy to kids and I used to get into this. And I used to actually, I used to teach in a, an inflatable planetarium called Star Lab. And if the group was really good and they were really into it, at the end, I would take them sort of on this journey through space. You know, light travels at about 80, 186,000 miles per second. And the distance, light year is a distance. It's how far light travels in one year at 186,000 miles per second. So when you look up at the sun, for instance, when you look up at the sun, you're looking at the sun where it was eight minutes ago. Because it takes eight minutes for light to travel 93 million miles to reach your eye. So actually, if the sun exploded right now, we wouldn't know it for eight minutes. You know, you'd be looking up, the sun would have exploded. You'd be up there looking and you would see, oh, look at the sun, it's a beautiful sunny day. And then all of a sudden, eight minutes later, you'd see it explode. Can you guys get that? That's kind of weird. <laughs> so- That it is. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, guess, I guess ever since I was a kid, a kid I always observed nature and, a, and the things that were going around me. And I tried to figure out the science behind it. And I remember when I was really, really little, I'm talking about like five or six years old, I was watching a, a display of fireworks that was happening, actually, because I, I lived on Long Island, I actually lived close to New York City, that was happening on Manhattan Island, which was probably four or five miles away from where I lived. So I would see the, the light from the explosion happened, but I wouldn't hear anything for about three or four seconds later. And I noticed the difference between when I could see the light and when I could hear the sound. That's almost like what this is. Something happens out in space 11 billion years ago. You don't get to see it until now. Just like the fireworks went off you know, three seconds ago, but I didn't hear it happen until, you know, three or four seconds later. It's kind of a hard concept to really understand it. You can see it. So since we know that light travels actually at a finite speed, we know how fast it goes. Everything you look at, you're looking at in the past. Even if you're four inches away from something, it takes time for the light to get from that object to your eye. So you're looking at it the way it was, not the way it is. Mm. Sounds like a Twilight Zone episode, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> what's, the, what's the fastest light or sound? I'm saying light. Yes, light. That's why when those fireworks went off, you could see, I could see the light first. Right. Because the light happens... You know, at that distance, it's almost instantaneous to my brain. It looks like it just happened. But since sound goes so much slower than light, it took a while for the sound waves to reach me. Cool, right? Yeah. Just like what, thunder. I'm thinking about thunder. You know, exactly. You see light part and then the thunder. That's actually, that's good, Conway. That's actually a really good analogy because that's something that anybody could see in their lifetime or notice, you know, there's actually a, a formula and I, I always forget the exact formula, but there's a way of determining once you see lightning, you could actually count in seconds how long it takes for you to hear the thunder. And right. you could figure out how far away the lightning is. <laughs> That's why I've always heard, if you can hear the thunder, you all right. It, exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, along the other lines, you know, this, <laughs> It's the same science, just not in a really more friendly way. 
But if you heard the gun go off, you're not dead. <laughs> <laughs> or you're not going to die because the bullet actually actually moves faster than sound. If you hear the bullet or if you hear the gun go off, you haven't been hit. I'll, I'll remember that when I need it. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's kind of funny. So like, you know, you, when you watch TV, now you can use this. You know, when somebody hears a shot, they duck. Well, it's too late, guys. <laughs> All right. So, um, oh, guys, it's almost been an hour. So how much time do we have? Yeah. Um, we should probably wrap up by 12.15. Okay. So, so you got I'll, about six minutes. I'll just do a couple more. So this one I find Reese. really... You want me to read this one? Researchers invent yarn made of human skin cells. Like, why would you want to do that, right? <laughs> Make yarn out exactly. of human skin cells. So, research at the Fresh International Institute of Health and Medical Research invented what they call human textile, which is essentially a yarn grown from human skin cells. One reason the human textile is valuable is because it does not trigger an immune response like other synthetic materials which can get in the way of the healing process. It can be woven into any shape and has been tested both on a rat and it completely healed within a few weeks and a sheep artery, which reportedly successful would stop and stop leaking. So guys, think about this. You know, I remember, I'll give you this a, a personal experience. I remember when I had to get hernia surgery, they wanted to put a mesh in to hold my skin together. And I refused, I told them I didn't want the mesh. Because if you look back, any foreign substance you put into your body is a foreign substance. And it can cause really serious reactions. You know, when you watch TV, you watch on the news, you'll actually see legal representatives like lawyers and stuff like that actually putting it out to you saying, if you got a hernia mesh within the last 10 years, you could have a law, you know, you could win lots of money or so on. So <laughs> what happens is they put this foreign thing into your body. Your body does not recognize it as supposing to be there and your body relax, reacts to it. And some people, it's no big deal, but some people can have a really bad reaction. You know, when you take somebody, if you have a heart transplant or a lung transplant or something like that, the biggest problem is that thing being rejected. And if it gets rejected, you know, you can't keep that thing in your body. So they give you these immune suppressing drugs to keep your immune system from attacking it. So imagine if we could actually make a new lung out of your own human cells then transplant it into your body, there would be no worry about it being rejected. So this is the very basics of what could in the future, you know, the kind of thing that you see on Star Trek where you could actually just replace your own lung with your own, you know, your own um, skin cells. So, you know, even when, even when a person gets a really bad cut off, for instance, like burn victims, you could actually, you know, they put these, um, bandages and stuff on a person's wound, if the person's body rejects that, it can actually cause a lot of problems. But if you make it out of human cells, the body's not going to reject it. Okay. What about right, guys, shots? What's that? What about shots, like flu shots and other kind of shots? What about shots. them? As far as oh, your I, body rejecting yeah. it, you mean? Yeah. Well, I really can't get into that because I'm not an expert on it. And uh, um, I mean, I have my own opinions yeah, about yeah, such things. Uh, yeah. But that's one of the things you really need to do research on and find out, you know, what the best thing for you is, really. I mean, are there people dying of vaccines? Yeah, absolutely, all around the world. But should that mean you shouldn't get one? You know, that's going to be a personal yeah, that's going to be a personal thing. You know, and, and obviously the vaccines are also helping a lot of people. So keep that in mind, right? So you kind of have to weigh them. But like they, like the one, 
the previous one of the previous slides where they used the actual cancer cells to make a vaccine to attack a specific cancer. That's not going to attack any other cell, but that cancer cell. So think about that. I mean, that's a really good point. That's a really good use of a vaccine, right? You know, this, this, this discussion can go in a million different directions. And this, like I said, this is just a drop in the bucket of what scientists can do with this technology that they just invented. And just the fact that they can make this is amazing. And now they're gonna to start to see where they can use it for the benefit of people. Hmm. All right, guys. Pretty anyway. amazing. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Let me uh, escape this so you can close this out. Okay. All right, guys, um, any, any last minute questions? If, any, if anybody has any ideas what we could talk about next month, let me know. I'd rather talk about things that you're interested in than things I'm interested in. So um, get the word out to Jackie or myself and say, I would love for you to talk about whatever. Okay. Yeah. But I, don't, I like, I enjoy this one. So you, you're doing some good ones. All right, cool. Thanks. Yes, he is. Yeah, right, I enjoyed it too. Thank you. Who was that? I enjoyed it. I enjoy it because I never thought about oh, that a dog pertains to dogs and stuff like that when it comes to different ailments. Yeah, you know, a lot of science actually uses other animals to test things on before they use them for humans. They want to make sure that it's safe enough. And, you know, if it's working on dogs, there's a good chance that it could work on people for sure. <laughs> Yeah, that was something new to me.